Good morning. Uh, this subcommittee will now convene of the Oversight and Investigation Subcommittee of Energy and Commerce. And this hearing today is to continue the examination of the state health insurance marketplaces established under the Affordable Care Act, the ACA. On September 29th, the committee heard from a panel of witnesses representing six state exchanges. While attempting to paint a rosy picture, it is clear that there are serious short-term and long-term problems with state exchanges. One of our main concerns we will address today is how Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, is conducting oversight over the billions of taxpayer dollars invested in establishing the state exchanges. Today, we expect direct and honest answers from CMS Acting Administrator Andy Slavitt, and welcome back, sir. To date, CMS has handed out $5.51 billion to the states to help them establish insurance exchanges. Despite this whopping investment of taxpayer dollars, four states' exchanges have been turned entirely over to the federal exchange, while countless others are struggling to become self-sustaining. As the federal dollars run dry and enrollment numbers appear far below administration projections, all state exchanges face significant budget short. At which point, federal establishment grant money could not be used to operate the exchanges, not be used. Yet CMS has been issuing no-cost extensions to state exchanges, allowing them to use the remainder of the federal grants through 2015, and in some cases, 2016, against intent and letter of the law. Federal funds still cannot be used for operational costs. But because of lax oversight and weak guidance, we don't know whether or not state exchanges have actually spent this federal money appropriately. We intend to get clear answers today. In the over five years since the ACA was enacted, CMS has issued only two guidance documents to inform state exchanges on the permissible ways to spend federal establishment funds. The first guidance, issued in March 2014, was less than a page. The second guidance came only after the HHS Office of Inspector General issued an alert to Acting Administrator Andy Slavitt highlighting with urgency the state exchanges, that state exchanges, may be using grant funds for operational expenses, which is not allowed. In fact, the OIG had discovered, based on budget documents, the Washington Health Benefit Exchange might have used $10 million in establishment grant funds to support operations such as printing, postage, and bank fees. Again, not allowed. HHS, OIG, urged Acting Administrator Slavitt to develop and issue clear guidance to the state exchanges on the appropriate use of establishment grant funds. What followed was a vague two-page guidance document bereft of concrete examples. Based on these, quote, guidances, unquote, one wonders if CMS is encouraging the state exchanges to spend federal dollars in any way possible against the stated purposes of the law to keep these costs or even transition costs when a state exchange shuts down and moves to the federal platform. It hasn't been always easy to discern, however, because these funds have been commingled and expenses and costs have been redefined. For example, rent, which is an operational cost by any definition, suddenly becomes business development costs. The system seems to be convoluted by design. In spite of or perhaps because of CMS hands-off approach, the state exchanges are struggling to become self-sustaining. They continue to face IT problems, lower than expected enrollment numbers, and growing maintenance costs. And as the HHS OIG pointed out in its alert, state exchanges are facing uncertainties in revenue. Four state exchanges, Hawaii, Nevada, New Mexico, and Oregon, have already shut down their state exchanges. And these four states alone receive $733 million in federal establishment grants. The taxpayers' return on investment appears minimal at best. Further, there is little indication that CMS has attempted to recoup any of this money. It is our hope that Acting Administrator Slavitt commits to and lays out a blueprint for recouping these lost federal dollars so that the American people are not footing the tab for yet another ACA failure. And to better understand the, the challenges these state exchanges face to ensure more tax dollars aren't wasted, this committee has a number of questions. Why are state exchanges struggling to become self-sustaining, especially given the extraordinary taxpayer investment? Is a lack of CMS accountability or oversight? Is CMS encouraging fiscal restraint? or instead taking a hands-off approach, which has allowed money to be spent uncontrollably, unwisely, and maybe even impermissibly. And where an exchange has decided to shut down, has CMS sought to recoup any of the federal grant dollars? Lastly, are the exchanges doomed to fail? In my estimation, CMS oversight has been woefully sloppy at best and willfully ignorant at worst, but obvious, with obvious spending abuses, costing taxpayers 
millions and counting from the states. We hope that CMS will be forthright on answering the committee's many outstanding questions on its failure in overseeing the ACA state exchanges, as well as provide members a blueprint on how the administration will recoup lost taxpayer dollars moving forward. Right now, the situation is a mess and taxpayers are on the losing side, and that is simply unacceptable. This hearing comes at a time when premiums for low-cost plans are on the rise, major insurers are publicly questioning their decisions to join the exchanges, co-ops are failing at an alarming rate, and state exchanges are expressing doubts about their ability to exist long-term. Mounting evidence suggests the ACA faces insurmountable problems in 2016 and today. We have an opportunity to ask CMS top official if and when the administration will finally address these concerns in a meaningful way. So I thank Acting Administrator Andy Slavitt for testifying today and look forward to hearing questions uh, answers to our questions, not more questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, today we're having yet another hearing on the Affordable Care Act. As usual, Mr. Chairman, I'm disappointed that here we are on having another hearing focused on undermining the law rather than focusing our efforts on trying to make the law work better. And I know, with respect to the topic of this hearing today, CM will see how we can partner to make that happen. Since the ACA was passed over five years ago, this committee has held dozens of oversight hearings on the law. Not one of them has been focused on ways to make the law work better. Not one of them has, has presented a balanced view of the law's benefits. But despite that, we've gotten a lot of good news out of these hearings about the number of Americans that the law is helping and about what the agencies are trying to do to improve coverage despite some of the bumps in the road. Um, but, you know, even more disturbingly to me, though, um, it's, been, it's been really an uphill climb to try to implement this legislation because some of our colleagues, both here in Congress and around the country, have intentionally placed roadblocks to implementation that actually make it harder for their own constituents to access care. Some of the governors, when the law was passed, refused to implement the Medicaid expansion, which would give health care coverage to millions of lower income Americans. One Republican presidential candidate, who also happens to be a US senator, recently bragged that he killed Obamacare by limiting risk quarter payments. I've got two things to say in response to that. First, I think it's really disappointing that members of Congress would brag facts. The Affordable Care Act is not going anywhere. Despite countless attempts to repeal, undermine, defund, and defame the law, the Affordable Care Act is making comprehensive health care a reality for American families. It's saving lives. Since passage of the law more than five years ago, an estimated 17.6 million Americans have gained health coverage through the ACA's various provisions. According to the recent CDC data, the uninsured rate has dropped to a historic low of 9%, down from 16% in 2010. I just ran into my Colorado folks yesterday at the airport coming out here, and they told me despite the uh, failure of the Colorado co-op just a month or two ago, they're expecting because of the uh, revisions and innovations they're making in Colorado, they may be up to 95% coverage in Colorado pretty soon. That's extraordinary for the health care of our constituents, and that's what we should be working to achieve. I've got an article from the New York Times entitled, Rise in Cervical Cancer Detection is Linked to Affordable Health Care, Mr. Chairman. According to researchers from the American Cancer Society, more women are receiving an early diagnosis of cervical cancer due to an increase in health insurance coverage under the ACA, and I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put that in the record. Without objection, sir. Early diagnosis of cervical cancer improves women's prospects for survival of the disease, and it also bolsters their um, hope to preserve fertility during treatment. And women with health insurance are far more likely to get a screening uh, that can identify cervical cancer early. I, you know, I know, I know that it's hard to make this specific about constituents. It's hard sometimes for my colleagues on the other side of the and a lot of people like me think we could be making it even better. Um, I, the reason I'm talking about this this morning is because on the House floor, we will be likely voting this week on a reconciliation bill to repeal key parts of the Affordable Care Act. This will be, by our calculation, the 62nd attempt to eliminate or repeal key provisions of the ACA. 
If enacted, virtually all of the historic gains in health coverage we've made in the last five years would be lost. This would be a tragedy for the American people and a gross failure of leadership. You know, we've done so much good this year in this subcommittee. We, we did um, bipartisan work on uh, uh, pandemic flu. We did bipartisan work on the Volkswagen investigation and many other things. I think this could be the committee where we had these hearings and then we sat down to think about how to improve rather than to undermine the Affordable Care Act. I hope that's what we'll do in the next year, but frankly, I don't hold out a lot of hope. I yield back. General yields back. Before I introduce the next person, I want to welcome today, we have several members here uh, from the National Democrat Institute in support of the House Democracy Partnership. This is a peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange, co-chaired by Representative Peter Ross and Representative David Price. And we have guests with us from Kenya and Peru. Is that? Welcome here. Welcome. Um, just to let you know, we, we, uh, this is a love fest among us. We all like each other. <laughs> So take back to your country. Sometimes we may argue, but in the end, we still are in here for the same cause. So I hope this if is valuable. If the chairman will yield. Yes. We, we might disagree, but we disagree in a civil way. Watch this, see? <laughs> That's going too far. <laughs> Thank you. And now recognize uh, Mr. Upton for five minutes. Well, I thank the, the good chairman. Uh, today we continue our oversight into the Obama state health insurance marketplaces. Hardworking taxpayers invested some $5.5 billion to establish these state exchanges, yet they still continue to struggle, as we know. The exchanges are struggling to sign up new customers, struggling to cover operational costs, struggling to fix ongoing IT systems problems, and ultimately struggling to become self-sustaining. We welcome the CMS uh, Acting Administrator, Mr. Slavitt, today, and we appreciate his testimony on this very important issue. As the state exchanges struggle to survive, we seek to understand CMS's role in overseeing them. The government's robust investment of federal funds into state exchanges should be accompanied by equally robust accountability by these stewards of taxpayer dollars. Yet the committee's oversight has revealed that CMS took a hands-off approach to the state exchanges. For example, CMS rubber-stamped no-cost extension request issued permission this is not acceptable. We want to hear directly how CMS plans to improve its oversight over the state exchanges to ensure that they are spending some grant dollars legally, actually all grant dollars legally, and wisely. We also must understand the long-term sustainability of the state exchanges, especially against the backdrop of rising premiums, failing co-ops, and insurance companies doubting their participation in the exchanges next year. The writing is on the wall that we very well could see yet another big taxpayer investment spiral down the drain. So it's critical that we all understand the short and long-term challenges that state exchanges are facing, as well as what CMS is doing to help the exchanges confront the challenges. Regardless of one's views of the President's health law, the law and its implementation demand oversight. As we continue to see today, Billions of dollars are certainly at stake, and I yield the balance of my time to Vice Chair Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Slavitt, welcome. We appreciate that you're here. You know, shopping on the federal exchange was supposed to be as simple as shopping for insurance on kayak or insurance, and that absolutely has not happened. And what we continue to hear from our constituents is that this insurance, the Obamacare insurance product, is too expensive to use once they do get it because of the copays, the deductibles, and the premiums that are there. It's an, a very expensive product. We want to look at the GAO report from September. Today, we want to go through this with you, uh, as both Chairman Upton, Chairman Murphy have said, it is very difficult for our constituents. And basically, what it appears is that this has been a false promise that was given to people, that they would have health care access because they were going to have insurance, and that has not come about. So we are very concerned about the dollars that have been spent on these state exchanges, we're concerned about the quality of the product, and I yield the balance of my time to Dr. Burgess. Well, thank you for yielding. Um, 
look, the administration has invested billions of dollars in an experiment. An experiment that did not include the necessary safeguards and, in fact, ignored successful models in the private market. The health benefit exchanges are one such experiment. Millions of tax billions of taxpayer dollars have been pumped into reinventing the wheel, and millions of Americans, myself included, have been forced to rely on exchanges to purchase health care coverage. My experience as a consumer on healthcare.gov has been extremely frustrating. And my experience as a member of Congress and a member of this committee and this subcommittee has been just as frustrating. I know there are those who want to accuse us of un trying to undermine the law. That, in fact, is not the case. The law should work. And we, as members of this subcommittee, we, as members of this full committee, we, as members of Congress, have a constitutional obligation for oversight as to how those federal dollars are spent. It has been extremely difficult getting questions answered. It has been extremely difficult getting information. That needs to change. Now, I hope in this last year of the administration, we perhaps can at, at least now admit to each other that there are serious problems with the law as it stands, and there are serious actions that we could take to fix those. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back the time. Thank you, gentlemen. Yields back, and I recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're here today for yet another hearing to attack the Affordable Care Act since the August recess in the state exchanges and CMS to criticize them, and they have burdened them with massive document requests in the middle of the open enrollment. I do not mean to suggest that we should not be doing oversight of the implementation of the ACA, but what we're seeing from my Republican colleagues is not balanced oversight designed to improve the law. Instead, the majority's efforts are simply designed to hamper implementation and undermine the Affordable Care Act regardless of the facts. Frankly, it's incredibly frustrating to sit here time and time again listening to my Republican colleagues lay into the administration's witnesses, criticize the efforts of their departments without any sense of perspective on the historic gains in coverage that have been achieved. I would have hoped that by this point, nearly six years after the passage of the law, we could add a balanced perspective on where implementation of the law faces challenges, but just as importantly, where it is helping Americans lead better lives and become more productive citizens. We should be talking about ideas to advance the mission of the law, to provide quality, affordable care to all of our constituents, or even make key fixes where appropriate. We should be holding hearings about ways to target the remaining uninsured. As CMS will testify today, the ACA is clearly making a huge difference in the lives of millions of Americans. It's making families stronger. It's making states stronger. It is making America stronger. The law has faced challenges, but we have had many more successes than you never hear about from my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. So I'm just going to take a moment to ensure that we hear some of the successes in today's hearings. Because of the Affordable Care Act, 17.6 million uninsured people have gained coverage through the law's various coverage provisions. Since the start of this year's open enrollment period on November 1st, 2 million Americans have selected plans through the federally facilitated exchange. More and more states are making the right decision on Medicaid expansion, which is benefiting their most vulnerable citizens as well as saving billions of dollars. Pre-existing conditions can no longer preclude individuals from gaining health insurance. Consumers do not have to worry about losing coverage if their employment changes. Reductions in the uninsured rate mean that doctors and hospitals provide less uncompensated care, which means fewer costs are being passed along to consumers and employers who pay premiums for health coverage. Instead of acknowledging any of these successes, my Republican colleagues insist on holding more hearings and debating more bills to undermine the law. And what's worse, they're actively trying to take health insurance away from those who now have it. This week, the House may be voting on reconciliation bill to repeal key parts of the Affordable Care Act. This is the House Republicans' 62nd attempt to repeal or undermine key provisions of the law. The Republican bill eliminates subsidies for individuals purchasing coverage through the exchanges and eliminates the Medicaid expansion. According to the Congressional Budget Office, the GOP bill would increase the number of uninsured Americans by at least 22 million by 2018. 
The Republican bill would undo many of the historic gains in health coverage we've made in the past five years, while offering nothing to help those who will lose coverage or to make health care more affordable and available for all Americans. As for a viable Republican alternative to the Affordable Care Act, which Republicans, Republicans have said they would offer for several years now, let me just say this. I'll believe it when I see it because I haven't seen it. Let's actually work in a productive, bipartisan way to make the Affordable Care Act work better instead of taking empty, meaningless votes to repeal it and take insurance coverage away from our constituents. And I yield back. I ask unanimous consent that members with written opening statements be introduced in the record. Without objection, documents will be entered in the record. Uh, Mr. Slavitt, as you're aware, the committee is holding a best of a hearing and when doing so has the practice of taking testimony under oath. Do you have any objections to testifying under oath? I do not. And the chair then advise you that under the rules of the House and rules of the committee, you're entitled to be advised by counsel. Do you desire to be advised by counsel during the hearing today? I do not. Thank you. In that case, would you please rise, raise your right hand, I'll swear you in. I swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Look for show the witnesses said yes. You are now under oath and subject to the penalties set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. You may now give a five-minute summary of your written statement. Thank you. Chairman Murphy, Ranking Member Duguette, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to discuss state-based health insurance marketplaces. I'm Andy Slavitt, the Acting Administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. CMS is working hard for the American healthcare consumer and American taxpayer to provide access to affordable, quality health care coverage. Marketplaces, whether offered through states or through federally facilitated marketplaces, allow individuals and families access to information, tools, personal help, consumer protections, and an array of health plan options from private sector health plans. Setting up and managing a state marketplace is, is a significant task, and I'd like to talk now about how we provide oversight and assistance to the marketplaces, but also watch over the American taxpayers' dollars. In considering our oversight role, it's important to understand all the responsibilities of a state-based marketplace. States must establish the infrastructure to review and qualify health plan offerings, develop online and call center capabilities to provide eligibility and enrollment services, interface with state Medicaid systems, develop cybersecurity capabilities, outreach and education functions, and dozens of other activities. We've seen significant successes as states have innovated to meet the needs of their populations and are successfully serving their populations today, having insured millions of people. Every state has also had its share of challenges during the startup phase, including five who have had more significant IT challenges. And IT typically represents 30 to 50 percent of a state's development budget given their other responsibilities. In discussing now our three key oversight priorities, I want to focus in particular on those situations where states have had more significant challenges. Our first priority is to be good stewards of the federal taxpayers' dollars. This means returning unspent dollars to the Treasury and closing grants, collecting improperly spent dollars, and preventing more from going out the door. Over $200 million of the original grant awards have already been returned to the federal government, and we're now in the process of collecting and returning more. This also means no new money to fix IT problems was given or will be given to any of the five states or any other state that ran into difficulties. We should not pay twice for the same result. Second, our job is to manage every dollar tightly. I've always been a big believer in preventing problems so we can spend less time recovering from them. Every state-based marketplace has external funding sufficient to run their operations. Federal money may not be used for regular operations. We do all dollars. Important to our approach, we maintain control of the purse strings, and 69 times this year we've denied use of federal funds. We also make adjustments through readiness reviews, detailed reporting, regular audits, and site visits. Third, and perhaps most important, we assist the state in getting a return on their investment as measured by the value they provide to their state. For all the challenges they've had, their ingenuity, their persistence, and their commitment to state residents has paid off for millions of Americans. As of June 30, state-based marketplaces provided coverage to approximately 2.9 million people in private health plans. They've helped millions access Medicaid, and the uninsured rates in these states have declined 
an average of 47% since 2013 to under 10%. Now I've worked in healthcare in the private sector since the early 1990s and joined the government only early last, only last year. Among other things, I founded a company that assisted people who were on and underinsured and ran a large scale data and analytics and healthcare consulting organization touching virtually every part of the healthcare system. I can just tell you from my perspective what a significant advancement has been made for American families in a short time by giving people access to care and helping alleviate the financial worries that come from not being able to protect one's own family. Having done it many times, I can also tell you how difficult it is and how difficult it can be to launch and operate any new enterprise of this scale. In conclusion, I have the privilege of serving as acting administrator while we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of Medicare and Medicaid. The perspective this offers is that at this early stage of the marketplace, there are millions still to educate and enroll, and state health leaders and the private sector are continuing to find the best, most efficient ways of meeting their needs of these populations. CMS's oversight responsibilities are also critical in this equation. CMS, CMS must not only be accountable for these responsibilities, but we must take every opportunity to find ways to improve how we do our job, including taking outside input, so we can best fulfill our dual mission of providing access to affordable health care coverage for consumers and protecting the investment by taxpayers. We do appreciate the subcommittee's interest in this area, and I am happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Slavin. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Um, the HHS Office of Inspector General Alert found that Washington State's exchange had budgeted 10 million federal grant dollars for operational expenses, including printing, postage, and bank fees from July of this year through December 31st of this year. These expenses are prohibited, but CMS had approved them in Washington's grant application. Now, I know you just said you screened these things, so how did CMS miss that Washington State Exchange was spending federal establishment dollars on operational costs? So I believe, if I'm correct, that the early alert uh, stated that there was a potential that there may have been mis misspent funds, but I don't think the, the OIG made that conclusion. And we conducted an investigation and looked through all of their funds I think there's been a, there were a few adjustments made, but I don't know with the state of Washington, but that's in process. So, but the OIG did say that that was occurring. So you're saying there was a, a since then an adjustment that you have made in discussing with the OIG? There's been there's been plenty of adjustments with the states. We we have just by background, really, and we we take advantage of the work of the OIG and we go conduct further investigation ourselves. I don't think we re, I don't think we believe that all of those 10 million were properly classified. I think we did find there was some, however. Could you make sure you get as details of that because the OIG and, and, and would you have found these if the OIG had not okay. pointed these out? I wouldn't, I wouldn't represent the, that our team finds everything. I would say we have multiple pieces of the process, most important being prevention, because if once the dollar goes out the door, it's, you have to spend effort to collect it. So we, we spend a lot of effort preventing things from being misclassified. We do, however, find things and collect them, and I think OIG also finds things that we don't find, and when they do, we have a period of time that, that extends three years past when the grant periods end which haven't even, the clock hasn't started ticking yet. So we, we will uh, make sure we collect anything that gets uncovered. And with that, do you then post what your findings are in the OIG to say this is all in the inner? Yes, states are all quite aware. Um, would you make sure you share that with us in rating too? That would be helpful. Yes. Um, is it appropriate for state exchanges to transition to healthcare.gov after spending hundreds of millions of taxpayers' dollars on their own sites? And shouldn't there be other consequences for that? I mean, they failed, but they spent all this money, and then later it said, gee, Sorry, it didn't work out. Um, does that seem appropriate? Well, I think it's important to, for us to recognize states have the, the right under the law to decide whether they want to be a state-based exchange or federal exchange or to be a state-based exchange and use our platform. They have a right to change their mind for a variety of reasons, including technical or otherwise. So um, we think that's important. What is also important is that if we find that any money has either been misspent or we have uh, granted money that we believe the state no longer needs, we control the purse strings and have the right to collect money back. And we've, in fact, done that. We have collected money from recently the state of Maryland uh, in a similar situation. So, but my concern is this. So with regard to the states trying to get into the insurance business, and it didn't work out for many states, but there's no real consequence if they were able to take the money, say, toss their hands up and says, well, it turns out it didn't work out. We'll just go to the federal exchange. And this is where my concern is, and many of us have a concern that under those circumstances, if there were no consequences, 
then that's hardly a lesson. So this is where I want to know, do you have any plan or intention to gather back to recoup the federal funds that have been provided to states to set up their exchanges only to then shift into healthcare.gov? Okay. So there's, there's five states that I think have had most significant IT challenges. Two of them maintained their role as state exchanges. Three of them are now using the federal exchange platform but are still state-based exchanges. And in each of those cases is slightly different. In one of those cases, um, we have recovered money. In another case, the, uh, the state is, two of the other cases, I should say, states in process of trying to recover money, of which we will then go after our federal share. And in one of the, uh, one of the other states, um, we are in the process of also closing down and collecting some money. So it, it really varies by state, but I would think it's important to point out that even those states that had challenges, they were, by every measure, able to enroll people, they had contingency plans, and eventually able to set up um, a, a system that worked, which, which extends, as I said earlier, beyond I understand technology. that, but it, but it was after a lot of failure, a lot of waste of money. And I would love it if you could give us something in writing of what your specific plan is with regard to uh, recouping these federal lost dollars. I yield now. Happy to do that. For five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm assuming that you're referring to this GAO report from September 2015 to Congress yes. in these questions. I'd ask unanimous consent to make that report a part of the record as well. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, Administrator Slavitt, uh, I just wanted to ask you, have you um, also reviewed this GAO report yes, I that the Chairman was asking you about? And one of the things that, that um, they said is that um, it was their finding that CMS had not all, that had established a framework for oversight, but it wasn't always effectively executed. Did you see that finding? Yes, I did. And uh, what's what's CMS's response to that to that finding? Yeah, I believe we concurred with that finding. You know, from our perspective, uh, we are overseeing a lot of grants, so. Engaging the uh, OIG, which we have worked in partnership with, as well as reports from GAO, are very helpful to us, and we take action when we get those findings. And so did you take action as a result of, of yes. that concurrence? Yes, we have. What did you do briefly? Uh, we built, uh, we've built a tool which allows and monitors and, uh, all of the funding before it occurs, and so we were able to collect money before to stop money from going out the door that shouldn't. And I, th I think this hooks onto the question the chairman was asking you, if you can supplement your responses by letting us know the policies that you've implemented, I think that would be great. Yes. Um, now, can you tell me about CMS's interactions with SBM officials, like we weekly check-in calls and site visits? Yes, uh, I think we have dozens, if not hundreds, of interactions. They <coughs> relate, as you say, from weekly check-in calls to monthly financials, to site visits, to audits. There. Um, Administrator, what types of reporting uh, are required from CMS establishment grant recipients and how are they used by CMS? So, you know, we, we conducted an OMB A123 financial audit. We have a smart program audit. There's an external security audit. The states have their own OIG and JO audits, many state legislature audits. Uh, so the, these numbers get poured over pretty and, and then how do you use them? Well, if we find that money has been improperly classified, uh, either as a cost allocation or as an operating expense when it wasn't, we go collect it. And what types of independent assessments and audits are required? Well, there's the OMB audit. Mm -hmm. There are, uh, there's a, uh, the OAG and JO audits. There's state audits. There's a large variety of audits that follow these monies. And so, sometimes, I, I think you said before, states do misclassify or misuse the um, grants. So what states, what steps does CMS take then to bring the state back into compliance? So I'll give you an example. We, we have, uh, we found that in the case of Arkansas, roughly a million dollars, and we're, we notified them and we're in the process of collecting that. There's three other states that have amounts of money that we thought were, were misclassified, but I'd also emphasize, Congresswoman, we do a lot more to prevent these from happening. Well, that was my next question, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think 69 times this year, we have caught in a request something that to be used for an for generally an operating purpose that we didn't believe was an operating purpose, we believe was a 
uh, I'm sorry, believed for a development purpose. We believed it was an actual operating purpose, and we denied the funding to begin with. And I think the committee in reviewing the original application, in reviewing the original request. Uh huh. And and um, what types of reviewer evaluation does CMS conduct on no cost extension requests? Pretty extensive requests. You know, and, and no, if someone's going to get a no cost extension, it really needs to be to fulfill what's what's part of their work plan that they have set up and that they just need more time to establish. I think we, we all know that these things are taking a little more time to implement than people originally thought. Now, I just want to shift, shift uh, my questioning for a second to talk about um, some of the things the ACA is doing. The most recent data from the CDC and Census Bureau found that the uninsured rate has fallen to 9% from 16% in 2010. Um, I'm wondering, is this a new historic low in the uninsured rate? I believe it is. Do you believe that the Medicaid expansion has played a significant role in these reductions? It has. Why, why do you say that? Uh, because we see millions of people in the states that have expanded Medicaid who now have access to coverage largely for the first time in many cases. They didn't have insurance didn't before. Have insurance before. Um, and and for, these, for these vulnerable citizens, um, can you talk about how the Medicaid expansion has impacted them? Yeah, certainly. I think when, you know, brief, very briefly, uh, Congresswoman, when it's these families get access to health care for the first time, uh, it changes their participation in the community in, in many profound ways, but it keeps them healthier, and I think that also reduces costs for the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You now recognize Ms. Blackford for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Slavitt, let's go to page 86 of the GAO report and take a look at that, if you don't mind. I don't have it in front of me, but I'm, if someone okay. could provide it to me, I have it. All righty. Well, on page 86, what you find is the grants that have gone out and the pool of money, which was $4.5 billion, and you've sent about $1.3 billion out the door. So what we want to know is where's the balance of the money? Where is it currently sitting? Yep. Do you have a proper accounting of that? Yeah, we do. We, we, in fact, we can provide you with an accounting of every dollar that's been spent, every dollar that hasn't been spent but we still have control of, uh, and we're in the process uh, in many cases of pulling that money back. Okay. Uh, then do provide us with that accounting because we will need to see that. Um, and, you know, if there is money that you – or let's go to the Arkansas situation. Okay. I know uh, you had said there was a million dollars there for unallowable. So tying back into what the chairman was asking you, when you have a situation, do you give them a plan of action and a timeline for returning that money to yes. the Treasury? Okay. Sometimes there's a little negotiation at first, but then we do that, yes. Okay. Uh, it seems interesting there would be negotiation if they used it for something that was not allowed. Well, I think really this is uh, all a matter of um, that us explaining to them why we believe it was unallowable. They're reviewing it, reviewing it with their lawyers. That takes okay. a little bit of time. And then all right. How many funded. other states have utilized funds for unallowables? For unallowables, I can think of at least three that we're in the process okay. of. We're in the process of. Working. And you plan to get all that money back? We do. Okay. Excellent. That sounds good. Um, I. Also in the GAO report, one of the things that is of concern to me is they say none, zero, nobody, not a one of these exchanges are meeting the desired operational outcomes in all functional categories envisioned by CMS. So at this stage of the process, doesn't this demonstrate that the systems are incomplete and incapable of functioning properly. Yeah. What, I, what I could tell you today is it was, was easy. Some of them bigger challenges than others, uh, but there have been some that are very, very successful, and I think the experimentation model of states doing this on their own has had Okay, then very how do you answer the GAO's assessment that none are meeting the desired functional outcomes? I, I think at any given point in time, uh, there have been challenges, been things that have been delayed, 
have been in contingency plans. And so these are. But I nobody is, is meeting the desired outcomes. We continue to get complaints about these exchanges. We hear from people that, you know, the dissatisfaction is rampant. It costs too much. It's too expensive to use. Uh, the exchanges don't work. And then you get a GAO report that says nobody is hitting the metrics. So uh, why did you continue to put money in on this if they're not meeting the functional outcomes, the desired outcomes, why are you continuing to put money into this? So uh, th I understand the question, and, uh, and, uh, and it's, an, it's an important question, of course. You know, 2.9 2 million people have been covered. I think that's their primary job of these exchanges. Uh, I think they are reaching the needs of populations that have never been covered before, and I think they're, they're so right in those So we've spent 4.5, or could spend $4.5 billion to get access to uh, 2.9 million people. That's you know, what you're saying. I'm saying that the I'm saying the states have reduced their uninsured rate, the states that have state-based marketplaces to under 10 percent, and they're still in the establishment phase. It's still early on. They're still working and building. And if we believe that there's money that's been either improperly spent or is money that's been part of a grant that's no longer needed, we have every ability to collect that money and we'll bring it back. And so I think so if you account. were in the private sector and you were five years into a rollout and you still weren't functional, would you give yourself an A or an F? Yeah, I wouldn't agree with the characterization that they're not functional at this point. Well, the GAO says they are not. So then you're disagreeing with the GAO report. I would say that at this point in time, the states are all functional. Are they perfect? Have okay, they so you disagree. Then the GAO says not any of them have hit the desired operational outcomes in all functional categories. Mr. Slavitt, that means it ain't working. Well, let me take a look at the, at the language they use, and I'll, I'll, let me get back to you on, on the Well, the I would think that you report. would have known that answer if you're functional or not before you came to a shield back. General Yosbeck, I would now recognize Mr. Pallone for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Despite uh, countless attempts by the Republicans to repeal and undermine and defund the Affordable Care Act, since CDC data, the uninsured rate has dropped to a historic low of 9 percent, down from 16 percent in 2010, and for the first time, more than 90 percent of all Americans have health insurance. So I wanted to ask Administrator Slava, can you put this in historic perspective, how significant is this drop in the uninsured rate, and can you comment on how the different coverage provisions of the ACA have operated to result in these gains in insurance coverage? Well, since, since at least I've been in healthcare in the early 1990s, there's really been no, very little progress up until 2013 in seeing the uninsured rate improve. So th these strike me as fairly significant improvements. I think they've come both from Medicaid. Of course, that these gains really are historic, and, and I, I want to thank you for all your contributions to making health insurance more affordable and available to millions of Americans. But looking to the future, it's my understanding uh, that this open enrollment season that we're in and future seasons are going to be more challenging because the most motivated individuals have already signed up, and the remaining individuals who are eligible are harder to reach. Is that correct? I think that's fair characterization. And uh, according to some experts, many of the remaining uninsured are actually uh, still unaware or confused about how federal subsidies are available to help them purchase insurance. So I just wanted to ask you a couple questions about that. How is CMS recalibrating its outreach and enrollment strategy in order to communicate with these harder to reach populations? You know, I think everybody in the marketplace needs to figure out how to continue to simplify not only the messages, but also how health care works and how health insurance works so that people can understand which doctors are in which networks, which drugs are in which formularies, how things like deductibles work, building tools for those things. These are very, very important uh, challenges and opportunities for all of us. And then, uh, am I correct in stating that nearly 80 percent of the uninsured who are eligible for marketplace coverage may be eligible for tax credits to purchase subsidized insurance in 2016. That's correct. So, I mean, these people are all, I mean, there's obvious advantages if they are made aware. W what is CMS doing to communicate um, so that they understand that they may be eligible for the subsidies? I don't know if you answered that, but I'd like to know more specifically if you could. So I think it's, for us, it's really a function of exactly as you said, Congressman, making sure people are aware that there are subsidies, that there are 
plenty of choices available for under $100 in premiums for most people, under $75 for many people, uh, and continuing to take that message to where people live and where they work in their communities. I have to remind myself all the time that these are people who have, many of whom have not had health insurance for a long time, and so they're not as connected to the process as the people who've been engaged so far. You know, in my own experience, um, when you began the open enrollment, I guess was what, in the early part of November, is that when it began? November 1st. Um, and um, we had um, a couple of events at, uh, you know, the centers that were being set up. And um, we there was a lot of, um, you know, outreach that was done, not so much in the traditional way, you know, with ads or, you know, media type things, but more, you know, just with people going around, uh, you know, with flyers and, you know, knocking on doors and that type of thing. And we did get a lot of uh, people actually show up, um, you know, even that first day. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hard. I mean, a lot of times you have to, you know, figure out exactly where your placement center is, you know, operate on weekends, um, you know, do things that are not easy, to, to be honest, to just to get people. And I just think that, um, you know, I, I know that a, a very good job is being done right now, you know, during this period to try to get to the people, but it is hard. And I, and I just, you know, even when I talk to people one-on-one -on -one and I explain to them that, you know, that they can get help with their premium, they're kind of shocked by it, which to me, you know, is surprising six years after, you know, we voted on this that, you know, people still don't understand that they can get help with their premium, but that's the reality. And this is one of the, the successes of state-based marketplaces because they understand their local populations better than anyone could here in Washington, D.C., and I think they do that nice job of that. Thank you. Now, I think you now recognize Mr. McKinley for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, thank you uh, for appearing for us, Mr. Slavitt. Um, Several comments. Uh, one, I, I think when your opening remarks, you you, uh, you touch on some of your mission statement of providing oversight and assistance, but what was missing, I thought, and uh, maybe I, because of my hearing loss, I, I might have missed something, but I didn't hear about accountability. Um, trying, to, trying to get people coming from the private sector, there is accountability. Um, we just said, just a quick grab this morning of, of things. Here was a person that, uh, uh, because he had he committed fraud, he's going to spend 30 months in prison. Here was another one that had uh, uh, paid $7 million in restitution to NIH. Uh, here's another one, individual that say 27 months for $335,000 uh, in fraudulent documentation. And here's another one, a uh, person is going to spend uh, 364 days in a county jail for $31,900 uh, in inappropriate expenditures. So what I'm, I'm wondering about here a little bit is, is just what are we doing? Are we just checking the box that you're providing guidance or are you holding people accountable either in your department or at the affected like Arkansas? Is, is anyone going to be held accountable? Yeah. We're, we are accountable for making sure that the federal tax dollars are getting spent properly, and we're accountable f and have been collecting uh, federal tax dollars when they've been uh, misused. They're not. Uh, they're not. Okay. Could you tell me has, has anyone lost their job uh, at a state in a state? Yeah, in the state or in your own department? If you've if you've no if you cut they they've given inappropriate advice. These people all have gone to prison as a result of doing something wrong. I can't speak Is to what's happening in the states. But I would, I would tell you that just because a state misclassified um, information doesn't necessarily mean that they did it with intent. And that each case, as you know, is case by case. Well, I, I, I keep looking for a good analogy in a, in a quick term like this. Think of, uh, you seem to be like a, a policeman or a state trooper along the road trying to keep people in guide and, and keep them under control. But when they speed, they're... They're, they're ticketed. They're fine. I, I'm just wondering what you're doing yeah. uh, for I'll, accountability uh, for that. Uh, if, if they abuse it, then they should be paying for it. Well, we're, we're, we're certainly willing to make all these things a matter of public record but, as we have. But you don't have any record. Anyone's been held accountable for anything going on. I'm sure there's been people throughout exchanges who've lost their jobs. Could, could you, you, could you share that back with me? Uh, and names of any... Just give me a handful of names, because surely during this process, as convoluted as it's... I, I would 
with all due respect, I have a little problem because in West Virginia, we only have um, uh, uh, one exchange in, in uh, representing the majority rate is approved. That's, that's not affordable. What, what, what should be done? What, what can we do in West Virginia? 19, almost a 20% hike in premiums. Yes, I believe, I believe West Virginia has seen uninsured rate move from 17.6% down to 8.3%. I think we're No, in, that's not the question I had. My question is about affordability. You, that's yeah, that's part of the title here of this bill is the Affordable Care Act, but it, it, under, the, under the entitlement, they can't afford it. Sure, I'll be happy to get back with you the specifics around the state of West Virginia. Um, what I can tell you is that for the majority of the residents, they still have opportunities to get covered for less than $100 a month. No doubt we take affordability seriously and a lot of work to do there, and I'm happy to visit with you about the state specifically. I'd, I'd love to hear it, and I, I just want to, again, I'm going to close again, which is I want accountability. That's what we've started with. Who is, who is going to be responsible for what's happening out here, all in federal government, but maybe it just in yours right now is over this uh, Affordable Care Act. Who's being held accountable? I look forward to talking to you. Okay. Thank you. You'll back. Right now. Um, Mr. McKinley, uh, when you refer to the affordability, are you referring to the, the premiums? If you could also get that information, that'd be helpful. Because okay. I now recognize from Florida, uh, Ms. Castor, recognize her five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and good morning, Mr. Good morning. Uh, survey after survey published by government and non-government uh, sources over the past year all confirm that the percentage of uninsured Americans has declined substantially uh, due to both the Affordable Care Act exchanges in marketplaces and also due to the expansion in Medicaid in many states. Uh, in fact, the census data from September found that the uninsured rate dropped in each and every state. And this is a wonderful accomplishment. It was one of the overriding goals uh, to ensure that our neighbors have that very basic, fundamental access to affordable health care. Uh, all, although all states saw a reduction in the uninsured rate, states that set up their own state-based marketplaces and expanded Medicaid saw the greatest gains. Uh, for example, according to the census data, and, and Mr. Yarmouth will like this, from 2013 to 2014, Kentucky showed an over 40 percent drop in the uninsured rate. Oregon's rate dropped 34 percent, and Minnesota's rate dropped 28 percent. And further declines in uninsured rates are likely to continue into the next year. Now, Florida, my home state, doesn't have a state-based marketplace, but we're going gangbusters on the number of my neighbors now that have access to an affordable plan. And it was announced just last week that uh, as my neighbors enroll and renew coverage, we're appro approaching over a half a million uh, so far, just over the past four weeks. That's out of the two million all across the country that are renewing in the federal marketplaces. And if you all are looking for a holiday gift for a loved one, for your son or daughter or niece or nephew, uh, be sure to get them enrolled by December 15th because then they can start their coverage on January 1st. We're very fortunate in the Tampa Bay area, the average cost of our standard uh, exchange insurance plan is actually dropping this year. And so it is very helpful to have that competition. In the areas where we have that competition, costs and the, the cost of plans are actually going down. Uh, but back to the, the state-based ex exchanges. Administrator Slavic, what did these declines in the uninsured rate tell us about the state-based marketplaces? Do you think that they are succeeding overall? Yes, Congresswoman, I think they are. I think the state-based marketplaces are, on average, doing even better than the federal marketplace reductions in the uninsured. And do you have a sense of how many people have enrolled in coverage through the state-based marketplaces so far? As of June 30th, I think the number was roughly 2.9 million people. And what role has uh, has the premium support uh, played in that? And who receives the, the premium support? Who is it available to? Sure. Uh, so the cost-sharing reductions and the tax credits uh, that are available through the Affordable Care Act um, really are allowing people to afford their coverage for the first time in many of these places, so it's been a big impact. And what we found in Florida is, you know, it, it's kind of complicated for folks who never had the ability to 
to afford uh, health care before, the navigators are playing a very important role because they'll sit down with you and go through all of the options and what makes sense for you or your family. And uh, you've seen the same thing uh, across Absolutely. the country? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was just at a community center and saw the exact same thing. And what more can we do to continue to lower the uninsured rates even further? Uh, so we are willing to work with any state that hasn't yet expanded Medicaid that has an interest in having a, a conversation about well, it. What do you, it yeah, that's term. my state. Boy, what we have thousands and thousands of my neighbors, and they, it's just been the Governor Scott's been so intransigent while it shows that it would lower costs. Uh, the chamber, businesses, hospitals are be behind it. Okay, you're willing to work, but what happens when you run into this brick wall of, of unreasonableness and, and unwillingness to expand Medicaid? Exactly. We, we're, well, we're willing to work with any state. We, we know the states uh, have their own sets of uh, local circumstances and concerns, and we're willing to entertain them on their terms. Uh, we are open for business for states that are interested. I know you're still willing to talk, talk to Florida. I, I hope you... <laughs> we can put the coalition together again to do it. And even though we have those challenges in certain states on Medicaid and there are going to be glitches and, and audit reports that are not so favorable in some ways, it's still important to remember the purpose uh, of these exchanges and the grants that support them is to provide affordable health coverage. And it's great to see uh, that the Affordable Care Act is providing that lifeline to affordable coverage and consumer protections in that the state and federal exchanges are achieving those goals. So thank you very much. Jillian yields back now. I recognize uh, Dr. Burgess for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Slavitt, I'm, I'm going to depart a little bit from the stated purpose of the hearing. It, it's so rare that we get the CMS administrator in here. I think it's in very two or three years. So there's some things that I, I, I feel like I need to ask you. So Complaints that uh, no one on the Republican side is trying to improve anything in health care. I have a bill out there, have had for some time, H.R. 1196, which would allow the um, bronze and silver level plans to be each considered as an HSA compatible plan by definition. Uh, one, of the, one of the mainstays of the Affordable Care Act is you got high deductible, high cost insurance. In the old days when I had an HSA, I bought for a lower premium, uh, I had a higher deductible and I could put some of that money away to use toward that high deductible. We've made it very, very difficult for people who have these high deductible policies. But again, I'd, I'd encourage people on the other side of the dais to look at H.R. 1196. If you can suggest improvements to it, perhaps we have something to talk about. But the basis is that every bronze or silver plan would be, by definition, HSA compatible. You wouldn't have to look. You wouldn't have to fight. You wouldn't have to try to, to find one that was HSA compatible. They all are, or they all would be. And then the other thing is uh, really pretty straightforward. Currently, I have a health savings account. I'm capped at $3,400 a year that I can contribute, but my deductible is $6,000 on a bronze plan in the PPO. So why not make those two amounts equal? And if the deductible is $6,000 in a bronze or silver level plan, let that be the uh, uh, the cap on the amount they can put away into the health savings account. Now, as I, I sit here and I listen to the discussion on both sides of the dais, um, you know, I feel like I'm stuck in a Dickens novel. It's the best of times. It's the worst of times. So I mean, I think the, a fair observation is that the Affordable Care Act has never had, never had even a plurality of positivity. It's about a 52 to 53 percent negative right now when you look at the, at the polling numbers. You have to ask yourself, you're giving something away, why aren't, why aren't people liking it more? And the answer is because even though you're giving something away, it's still really expensive to live under the Affordable Care Act. Now, miserable experiences that I've ever been through with trying to get signed up for that darn thing. But look, I've got an insurance premium that's higher than I've ever paid in my life. I have a deductible that quite honestly leaves me, at least in my consideration, functionally uninsured. People have asked me, well, is, is your doctor even on the list of providers that you can go to? I don't know. Because I'm not going to lose on a on an office call or an ER visit, and most people actually fall into that category. So once again, even though you have people with insurance, you have people who are financing 
a lot of their day-to-day health care needs out of cash flow, which is exactly the way it was before. The only difference was you could, in fact, buy an affordable policy before. Now you simply cannot. And, oh, by the way, we're going to fine you if you don't do that. Um, I also have a question about some of the implementation on, on the Affordable Care Act, and I apologize for doing this to you without warning you before, but Section 1311H, uh, subsection B, which deals with uh, H is, uh, of course, we're talking, this is talking about the exchanges. H deals with quality improvement, enhancing patient safety. It talks about A, a hospital with greater than 50 beds. The next paragraph is B, a healthcare provider. And here are healthcare providers that can, fun- can work in the exchange. Uh, only if a provider implements such mechanisms to improve health care quality as the secretary by regulation may require. And the start date for that was January of this year. Where is this in the, the rulemaking process? Has that, in fact, happened? Are people going to be excluded from the exchanges because they don't meet the secretary's definition of quality? And has the secretary defined quality? And are those definitions likely to change? Relative to exchanges, uh, I think I could spend uh, more time with you either here or in another setting kind of taking you through the quality steps. We're introducing a whole series of quality uh, reporting measures that are going to be coming uh, with the exchange shortly. Um, if I think I understand Have your, you excluded a provider based on yeah. quality? So if I understand, I'm not sure if I understand your question, co- uh, question correctly. I want to make sure that I study that particular subsection, but I don't believe that, you know, we do reviews, and I think we do reviews based upon the network ad- adequacy. I'm not sure that we've yet excluded any provider uh, for a quality purpose at this point, but I will get back to you. Thank you. Thank you. So you now recognize Mr. Tonko for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, welcome, Administrator. Uh, Administrator Slobit, as you mentioned in your opening testimony, uh, we need to keep in perspective that the Affordable Care Act is working. And it is working best in states that have embraced the law and taken advantage of the tools that the uh, Affordable Care Act provides. When states take ownership of the law and its benefits, the residents of that state uh, see better outcomes. Uh, And let me use that as an example my home state uh, of New York. We expanded Medicaid. Uh, We set up our own exchange, the New York State of Health. And this year, we are one of the first states to utilize the basic health plan option, uh, known in New York as the essential plan. The essential plan will help people toward the lower end of the income uh, spectrum, but above the Medicaid eligibility line to gain access to quality health insurance for as little as $20 per month. Because New York has taken a proactive approach to health care reform, the citizens in our state have reaped the benefits. More than 2 million New Yorkers have enrolled in coverage uh, because of the uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, Certainly, with that in mind, um, and across the board, states have been, uh, have pursued the the state-based marketplace models, and uh, they're serving as laboratories for innovation, testing new models for enrollment, insurance, market oversight, and consumer protection. Uh, They are tailoring the ACA to uh, uh, their own given citizens. Um, With that in mind, uh, Administrator, California has been a leader in the uh, the, uh, active purchaser model. Uh, Can you explain what this is and how this has helped cover California uh, ensure access to high quality, affordable health insurance coverage? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I think this is an example of a state innovation where uh, California has really been, as, as the description says, actively involved in defining the benefit offerings for the residents of their state, I think quite successfully given, I think, both the um, number of, of uh, people that have been covered, but also um, the, the management of the, the rate of, uh, of cost has been, I think, quite good, and they've done a very nice job. Now, are other states taking similar approaches that you know of to yes. uh, certify, you know, qualified health plans? I believe there are several others, yes. Okay. Um, any number uh, that you have in mind of how many states? Yeah, let me get back to you on the exact number. I don't okay. know the exact number. Thank you. And, and what are the steps are the SBMs taking to improve the quality of care uh, to transform the uh, health care delivery system? So I've gotten back from a tour of several states, and, you know, they're each doing unique, innovative things. Some are, are health fairs, 
Um, some are uh, you know, reaching out into communities where uh, they've got specific needs. Uh, but again, I think this is a, a benefit of the model of a state having their own, ex operating their own exchange is it gives them more control to be able to tailor things to the needs of their population. And as we move forward, uh, does CMS plan to encourage states to set up and operate their own exchanges? Um, what federal support um, will exist out there will remain for uh, our other states to plan to continue to operate their own exchanges? Well, of course, there, there's no more new grant funding. And, and of course, the law provides every state the flexibility to, to make their own decision. But we will, of course, support uh, any state that wants to set up a state-based uh, marketplace. And you know, today, if a state wants to do this, they get the benefit of all of the best practices and lessons learned that the states that originally did it didn't have access to. Right. Do we hear from, do you hear from residents of these given states that uh, have not expanded Medicaid, Medicaid, for example, or established their own exchanges? Do you hear from any of the consumers? We do. We do frequently. And what's the, uh, what's that dialogue like? Is it one of concern, frustration? You know, I think anybody uh, who doesn't have coverage uh, has to manage their own personal family situation very differently than the rest of us do. They have to be, uh, they don't, you know, they don't do things typically like let their kids play a sport in school because they might get hurt or injured. So there's a whole, a whole set of things uh, that, you know, are in the insecurity of people's lives that, you know, those of us that have insurance don't have to deal with every day. Okay. Well, I certainly appreciate the work that you're doing. I know that it takes a lot of uh, focus and uh, concerted effort to uh, move us into, transition us into a new uh, era of healthcare delivery. And uh, we thank you for the work that you're doing at the agency. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentlemen, gentlemen yields back and be self-sustaining on or after uh, January 1st of 2015. At which point, according to CMS, states can no longer use grant funds to cover maintenance and operating costs for one, inadequate staff, and two, inadequate funding. And uh, you answered a question earlier, and in that question you said this. You said state-based exchanges are doing better than federal exchanges. So uh, given that the, the uh, GAO report says that the uh, state-based exchanges are having problems, that doesn't foretell good news for the federal exchange. Continuing, according to the GAO, none of the state-based exchanges were fully operational in all the required functional categories as of February 2015. You heard that from Ms. Blackburn's question. Four state-based exchanges have already transitioned to the federally facilitated marketplace because they failed to be self-sustaining. So my question is this, how many more state exchanges do you expect to, make the to fail to make the transition to the federal exchange? I believe what I said earlier was that states have been even more successful at reducing the uninsured rate the national average has been about 45 percent. States are, are doing, states that have state-based exchanges have done about 47 percent. So I think both successful, states even more so. All the okay, states let's, have, let's go to my question. Okay. So do you expect more state exchanges to fail to make the transition to the federal exchange? So all, all the states have access to a source of their own funding, either through an assessment that they have on the, on the health insurers in their state. So are you saying no budget. state exchanges are going to fail? Is I'm saying all states. Evaluations, how many state exchanges do you expect to be unsustainable and to fail and move to the federal system? Well, I can't predict who's going to come into the federal exchange in large part because there's a lot of factors, including okay. their own decision about whether or not so, they want to make So let me continue. Period. Given this trend, do you think that self-sustainability is and always has been a serious ex uh, uh, situation facing these, these exchanges, the state exchanges. So as I said, as of today, all of the states are, are sustainable. Whether they will be in the future, I'm not willing to predict, but as okay. of today, they are. Well, I don't think the, uh, the underlying economics of the ACA have not, ex not changed uh, since its inception. Now, did, was, there, was there any work that CMS did that would have, could have uh, uh, predicted that these state exchanges would fail? I mean, did you know in advance that any of the state exchanges would fail because of sustainability? So a lot of this comes before my time, but okay. I wouldn't classify a challenge as a failure. I think every state has had challenges, but every state today is successfully enrolling individuals in their state, and every state has sources of funds sufficient to run their operations. So I would, me I would measure that as a success. When CMS awarded $5.5 billion in federal marketplace grants for states to set up state-based exchanges, um, how could it have expected states like Hawaii or, or Nevada to sustain their own exchanges? 
So again, this is this is these are decisions that were made before my time, so I can't speak to what was being thought of at the time. I can tell you that uh, it's an ongoing process for states to make that evaluation. And as you're, I think you're aware, the states of Nevada and Hawaii have decided it would be more efficient for them to operate using our, maintain the state-based exchange, but use our platform. Be more efficient because they're broke and they couldn't afford to sustain themselves. Uh, you've had us ask questions in the past, how much has been recovered. I would ask uh, for granularity on that and from which states and how much each state still owns, owes um, that they have not uh, repaid back to the federal government. And the last question says, how will you ensure the states have not used and will not use grant funds for operating expenses after January 1st of 2015? So we, we do that. So yes, I will provide that information that you requested. And we do this through uh, several steps. Most importantly is to prevent them from spending the money improperly in the first place. And I think, as I said, this year, 2015, 69 occasions, we have rejected a state's request to spend the money improperly. Now, if they, if it turns out that that they have for some reason, uh, we'll, we conduct an audit uh, and we go back and then we go through a collection process. As I've said, um, we, we have uh, the first several states that we've begun the collection process for begin to refund money and we take that very seriously. Okay. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Jim yields back and I recognize gentleman, another gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mrs. Lavick, thank you for being here and thank CMS for working with us. Um, on something other than uh, the GAO report, Blue Cross Blue Shield recently announced that they were no longer be offering a PPO plan in the, uh, uh, the national exchange in Texas and in the, also in the individual market. This would mean there's no PPO plans on the individual and exchanges uh, policies. As a result, specialty hospitals like MD Anderson in Houston and Texas Children's Hospital will be out of network on individual plans for that. Group plans are not under the same uh, decision, so they will still have PPOs. Blue Cross and Blue, Cross, Blue Shield Texas pulled the PPO plan, citing that it's no longer financial feasible, that they could not raise rates for PPOs without raising their rates for all the plans. This problem is not just limited to the Texas uh, example because we're a national exchange and not a state exchange, but as reported as an issue in other exchanges across the country. Can C what can CMS do to address the issue of network adequacy that ensure that plans with premier and specialty hospital in network are available to consumers in the original market? Thank you for the question. Uh, so we have just uh, released a proposed rule around network adequacy. Um, the National uh, Association of Insurance Commissioners has also done some work in this area. But let me also say that this is an early stage of a market and consumers are in the process of communicating through what they, plans they choose, what things they're willing to pay for and what things they value and what things they don't. And the health plans, I think, are in the process of trying to figure out how to create offerings that are affordable and meet the needs of individuals. So I think we need to recognize this is still in year three of a, of a early set of uh, offerings. Mm -hmm. And I think if consumers uh, suggest that they will want certain things in their networks, then my suspicion is that the health plans in those states will begin to make those things available. Okay. Well, in the Houston market, if you don't have Texas Children's or MD Anderson or a major uh, full-purpose hospital that's in our medical center, you know, that's going to limit their opportunities for, for even using, uh, whether it's under the Affordable Care Act or the individual market that I know we don't have an impact on. Is there, from your perspective, is there any actions that Congress can take to address this issue? You know, I think we should just continue to listen to, all of us should continue to listen to, to residents. Uh, and make sure that we adjust and adapt uh, whatever our regulations are or however we are you know, viewing this in the, in the context of making sure that people are getting their, their basic sets of needs match. And we make sure that there is sufficient at network adequacy and we do a review uh, prior to allowing a state to go on to the exchange. And if we hear problems, we'd like your office to let us know of specific instances. Okay. Uh, we'll be glad to. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the open enrollment for 2016. Um, November 1st marked the beginning. While open enrollment continues to the end of January, I'm interested in hearing how things are going. Uh, I realize you may not be able to speak to the federal marketplace in terms of early data, but how are things going with the current open enrollment period and how many folks are shopping for and signing up for the, some of the plans? So as of November 28th, I think we've had 3.5 million applications this year during the open enrollment season, um, and there have been about 2 million plan selections, of which I believe 1.3 million 
uh, have been to renew coverage and 700,000 have been to get, uh, to get uh, new coverage. And, and of course, we are now just beginning a, a, what has been a very big ramp up period between now and December 15th. People tend to be deadline driven and this week we are seeing that, that acceleration that we'll, we expect to continue on through the middle of December. Having done events in our district in an urban area in Houston, both with the original sign up and, uh, and the second time, uh, you're right, we all procrastinate. Uh, what types of indications are you receiving from the states on their uh, enrollment? Any information on how enrollment's going in states that have their own plan? I've seen some preliminary data. It looks to be pretty close to on track to what they expected so far. Okay. I understand several ba state based marketplaces, have, as well as healthcare. Dot gov are offering enhanced shop and compare tools and enable consumers to make smarter choices regarding our coverage options. Uh, Administrator, could you elaborate on these efforts and what type of tools are state marketplaces offering consumers and why are such innovations important? Sure. You know, I think this allows me to speak to the question that was raised earlier about deductibles, and I think one thing that's very important for consumers to know is 80 percent of consumers, I believe, is the right number, have access to plans that offer services like primary care visits and prescription drugs outside of the deductible. In other words, they don't need to meet the deductible before they hit them. And the tools that you're describing allow people to understand whether or not a physician is in their network, whether or not a drug is covered in a specific plan, and of course, how to make the trade-offs that sometimes exist between coinsurance and premium levels, which I think is a complicated thing for people. So state-based exchanges, as well as the federal exchange, all have um, those types of tools, and I shouldn't say all, uh, many of them, and certainly the federal marketplace has those tools available. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, now recognize the um, gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen, recognized for five minutes. Sometimes that, uh, that seat must get uncomfortable, but there's real questions and real concerns, and I don't want people to get caught up that thinking that this is a partisan issue because really this is about taxpayer dollars and what's been going on with it and and if they're being misused uh, you know if we remember back this was supposed to be budget neutral and that hasn't taken place and so now the american taxpayers are on the hook for it and what's happening with the dollars where are they going uh what's the accountability process and so i, I kind of want to maybe go down a different path with you um, my understanding is that states operate on the federal exchange receive a 3.5 percent user fee for the platform is that correct the health plans have that user fee, not the states. The states, uh, or the health plan does? Yeah. <clears throat> so what happens to the 3.5% user fee then? Where does that go? 3.5% user fee goes to fund state, uh, exchange operations. So who pays that? Does the state pay that, or does the does The, the insurer, health insurance company. The, the company does? So yeah. the user, the insurer pays? Insurer, it. yes. All right, so it gets passed down to them. Um, if, if the state closes its marketplace and transitions into the healthcare.gov, is it required is is it required to charge the 3.5 percent? If uh, if a state <coughs> continues to operate as a state-based marketplace, right, but uses the federal platform, we just have a rule that was proposed last month uh, that's that's proposed. So it's it's still open for comment period on what the fee would be, and the fee that's proposed is 3 percent for the, the use states of the that are market. currently on it. Though, do they pay it? Do the does the insurers that participate in and the fee say it's just as Oklahoma. It's proposed, I'm sorry, the states that are. Well, we have some states that have obviously closed down and they've went now, if I'm not mistaken here, uh, they went um, into the marketplace or they translated out of the marketplace into healthcare.gov. Are they currently having to pay the 3.5% to participate in healthcare.gov, no. such as other states that were already in there. Again, the states don't make the payments, okay. the, the plans do. The plans do, but they're operating inside the state. The plans, it, yes. And and the proposed rule is for 2017. It would begin in January 2017. So Oregon, Nevada, and Hawaii that recently came out. Yes. They're not, their users inside the state, the insurers inside the state, are they required to pay the 3.5%? No, they make a payment to the state. Okay. The the current individuals, right. the, the current states are in it, are they paying the 3.5%? The three you just mentioned? No, they just came into it. Right. The current states are that are already operating oh. inside the healthcare.gov. Yes. They're paying it, but the states that are coming out aren't. Yes. Okay, w why? 
Oh, I don't. The, the law didn't contemplate a splitting of duties. One of the things well, the law didn't contemplate a lot of things. I mean, it, it didn't anticipate a lot of this. We so get that. But if if one state is the users inside the state is required to mm -hmm. pay for it, and another one isn't, then who's who's where's the offset coming from? So, so the first thing we had to do is determine how much is the appropriate amount to pay, given that the state maintains a lot of responsibilities. Remember, IT is just. 30 to 50 percent on average of all of the responsibilities relative to a state budget. We are setting, so once that's done, we are now setting the fee for 2017, contemplating the fact that they have had that year. The year they've been waived. The first year they've been waived, but the second year fee contemplates the fact that they didn't pay for one year. So the next year they're going to go to 7 percent? No, it's not 7 percent. Well, so if you're making up for the lost year, then where does it come from? The states have their own. Uh, another set of duties. So the calculation is not as simple as three and a half percent. The calculation is based upon what portion of the service. There's a lot of complications the inside this bill, and we understand that. Yeah. There's a lot of figuring that we can't get to. I'm trying. To, I'm literally trying to figure it out. It, what it, it, if they're trying to make up for it? Simple math is: if you waived it this year and they're trying to make it up for it the next year, then in 3.5 percent and adding an additional year to make up for it would be seven percent. Tell you what, that's not how the math works, and I'm happy to go sit down with you and walk you through how. Well, I, I obviously, works. because I'm, I'm confused in it, too, and I'm really not trying to be difficult. I'm just trying to figure out, is Oklahoma making up for the lost fee? If they're missing it, the state's already are that were already set up and the failures of the taxpayer. Walk you through the math. The thing I want to just make sure is clear is that the states that are using the federal exchange are still running call centers and 1095A collections and many, many other activities. So it's not part of the committee because I think all of us need to figure this out. Yes, and as I mentioned, this is part of a proposed rule. So there are certain sense that there are certain legal restrictions we have in terms of this, but I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Time has expired. Now recognize Mr. Yarmouth of Kentucky for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks to you, Administrator Slavitt, for being here and, and your work on this issue. Uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, this is a very timely hearing because as we're sitting here, uh, the inaugural events are underway for our new Kentucky Governor, Matt Bevan, and uh, he and I have very different perspectives on the Affordable Care Act in Kentucky. He's proposed as one of his campaign uh, uh, priorities to dismantle our state-based exchange, uh, which is called Connect. And I'm, I'm very proud to represent Louisville and proud of the work of our outgoing Governor, Steve Bashir, in implementing the Affordable Care Act. With the expansion of Medicaid in our state and the successful launch of Connect, we've seen more than 500,000 Kentuckians gain access to quality, affordable health care. The uninsured rate in the Commonwealth has dropped by more than half, and in my district by 81 percent, wow. which is pretty astounding. Uh, in, in my opinion, obviously, rolling back these successes would be short-sighted. It would jeopardize the health of a half million Kentuckians, waste millions of taxpayer dollars, cost us jobs, hurt us economically. And I'd like to ask you, Administrator, a few questions about what it would mean to undermine uh, our successful Exchange Connect. Uh, I believe I'm correct in about $280 million was spent in setting up uh, Kentucky's Exchange. Is that correct? It's a ballpark. Pretty substantial investment. And is it true that if we were to dis, uh, dismantle Connect and move into the federal exchange that Kentucky taxpayers would have to pay about $23 million? I've, I've seen secondhand a similar number, but it's true that there would be some expense to the state. Yeah. So millions of dollars would uh, be spent to shut down what uh, most pol health care policy experts consider to be a hugely successful exchange. As a matter of fact, one Republican state senator Ralph Alvarado, who is also a physician, has, has proposed marketing our exchange to other states because it's been so successful. Would you, on and, and behalf of CMS, uh, consider Kentucky's exchange a success? I would congratulate Kentucky and, this, and the state and everyone involved. It's, Kentucky's been a, a terrific success. Now, uh, segueing on uh, Congressman Mullen's questioning, we know now that uh, the federal exchange would be, a, that's what insurance companies pl plan uh, or pay in Kentucky. So clearly, if we move to the federal exchange, consumers would have to pay more for their to be passed on. I think that's those, reasonable. Those costs. 
So shutting down Connect will either raise health insurance premiums or drive insurers out of the market, cost taxpayers more than $20 million, eliminating hundreds of jobs and harming the Kentucky economy. Uh, Administrator, is there any way that you can think of that uh, cons Kentucky consumers would benefit from shutting down the Connect, our state-based exchange, and moving to the federal exchange? Well, of course, by law, these are state decisions, and we're willing in to cooperate and support the state in any way we can. But it feels like Kentucky's done such a great job, and it's been so successful uh, that it, it feels like it's, it's going to be a good course for consumers to stay where we are. But knowing what you know about it, is there any way in which consumers would benefit from that kind of switch? Not that I'm aware. Great. Thank you for that. Let, just before I close, one of the things that I think is, is important to recognize is that uh, while some premiums have still gone up, while we still have issues with uh, deductibles, and I, I'm very glad that you gave that explanation in the last uh, session about the, the reality of deductibles, that what we really need to focus on is figuring out how to deal with the high costs of health care. And we've seen incident after incident of uh, pharmaceutical costs going skyrocketing by several hundred percent or even a thousand percent. And that's really that. But isn't that still the biggest problem we face in health care? It's one of the critical issues that we all have to address. Great. I, I thank you for that. Now you'll back. Thank you. Gentleman Yellen's back. Now recognize uh, Ms. Brooks for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've been very surprised, actually, that the other side of the aisle seems to have focused on the uninsured rate, Medicaid expansion, other things that really haven't been relevant, I don't think, to the oversight of today's hearing. Um, I think it's our duty to provide that oversight because billions of dollars have been spent and are at stake. Um, and I'm, you know, I am very concerned about ensuring that our taxpayer dollars are spent effectively and efficiently, as I know you are, Minister Slaver. And I'm concerned um, because you have indicated that the states, um, in Congressman Flores's testimony, you indicated that the states have their own funding at some point, that the, those states with the exchanges, when the federal dollars run out, what is the source of funding you are referring to? Sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, so m most of the states, all but I think two, have some type of assessment that they, as that they assess the health plans that operate in their marketplace. In some cases, uh, it's a percentage. In some cases, it's a percentage plus a fat flat fee. And in some cases, it's based on how many members are enrolled. There are a few states that fund it directly out of state budget uh, as well. And because there are all of these different mechanisms and different ways states have decided to fund it, um, what confidence do you have that the different methods they have all chosen will be adequate so that the states will not be coming back to the federal government for more funding? Well, I have enough confidence that I need to check, make sure we check twice a year because things change with state budgets, things change with the membership, things change with enrollments, and sometimes we have to have difficult conversations with states to say to them, look, we don't think this, is, this looks like a very good future. Can you help explain to us why this makes sense? And in some cases, there's a little bit of tough love, um, which results in some, some of the changes in course that you've seen. Can you give us an idea how many tough love discussions are you having well, an example of a tough love conversation might be Hawaii, um, which, which has uh, been uh, in the, was in the process last year of trying to decide whether or not what was the best course for themselves. And we had conversations where we laid out the numbers uh, for them and I think that made that decision to come to the federal exchange. And, but how many states are you actually having discussions with about self-sustaining going forward in the future? So we're having discussions with all of the states. I wouldn't tell you we're concerned about all of the states, but I would tell you that, um, it, you know, as a general rule, uh, the smaller the state is, uh, the greater uh, the, the amount of effort we need to focus on them to make sure that they have a plan that's sustaining them. So do you have a chart that shows how many are, you're confident, they've got it, we're not going to have any problems with them, we're concerned, or we're really very, very concerned that they're not going to make it. And how many people are in those different buckets? 
Ma'am, you for states. You, Congresswoman, you must know me well. I have hundreds of charts, and I, and I could tell. Yes. Um, uh, so you know, I I think uh, I think I'd say that at this point in time, um, we are confident that all the states are sustainable for the period of time that they need to be sustainable for. How but, long is that? Well, as I say, we look at least every six months because point in time, if we believe a state is nearing the point when uh, we think they may not be sustainable, we talk to them. I'll give you another example. We talked to Rhode Island, which is, a, which is a small, obviously a smaller state, and this was last year or earlier in the year, and, and told them they needed to increase their sources of funding, and they, and they did that. But they did that because we had this kind of dialogue with them. So it's, we try to get out in front of the problem and prevent it from being, becoming a problem. Uh, along with the states, and the states have the same interests. Well, I, I appreciate that, and I am very concerned about the sustainability, particularly if we're only doing it in six-month increments in my brief time remaining. United Health has recently announced that it may leave the exchanges for next year. Could you please comment upon your thoughts about this announcement, what that might do to the exchanges and impact the sustainability of state exchanges if United Health, which is in my district, pulls out from all of these different exchanges because it has been a bad, quote, it was a bad decision for us per United Health. So I'll tell you what, I won't comment on any one specific uh, health plan. I think the majority of health plans that have made statements in the last few weeks have been very pictures with thousands of plans. And at any given time, there's going to be people entering the market and people exiting the market. Some will have good strategies, some will have not so good strategies. That's just how marketplaces will work as we interact with the private sector. Okay, thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Collins, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Slavitt, in late September, uh, HHS ordered that the New York State Co-op co set up by the Affordable Care Act, Health Republic, to shut down. This past year, Health Republic insured about 20 percent of the individuals on the New York State Health, in Health Insurance Exchange. So far, Health Republic's failure has cost taxpayers over $265 million, and 155,000 New Yorkers were kicked off their current insurance plan last week. While other insurers in the marketplace picked up the displaced beneficiaries and honored the deductibles, there remains heavy concerns about Health Republic's outstanding liabilities to providers. Doctors have been calling my office complaining that their checks from Health Republic are bouncing. And I've seen estimates that hospitals in the state are owed at least a financial filings and conferred with state regulators and co-op leaders during the setup and operation. I'm assuming that's a correct that, statement. That's correct, Congressman. So, I'm curious, can you walk me through the decision-making process? Our concerns are, why was the co-op, Health Republic, with the largest taxpayer losses in the country, allowed to continue as long as it did, which was up until a week ago? So I would say uh, we grew concerned about the financial situation of the co-ops with each consecutive financial report that they submitted, conducted our own audit, sent up our own people and worked very closely with the Department of Insurance in the state. You know, I, I will tell you that in situations like this, the most important thing from my perspective, you mentioned it, is making sure we get as smooth a transition as possible for all of the state, for all of the co-op consumers. So having a transition on December 1, all s seamlessly to smooth plans, that honored the deductible was, was important and I think was, it was great work from the Department of Insurance and the state and, uh, and I think that was very important. Your other, your other point relative to collection of, ultimate collection of payments, I think is a matter, of, it's more a matter of state policy regarding state guarantee funds uh, and, and other potential avenues and tools. We stand ready to assist both consumers and the state in any way we possibly can. So a simple question, will the providers, for instance, 160 million to the hospitals and many doctors where the checks are bouncing, are they going to be paid with 100 percent assurance? Again, that's a question that's better directed at the state because that's based on state policy. So the answer is no, they may not get paid. Again, you'd have to ask the state, but we'd be glad to cooperate in any way we can. I guess I live in the world, if the, the answer is not yes, it must be no? The answer is I'm not going to speak for the state with okay, all due respect. Well, 
I, I'll take the lack of an affirmative as if I'm a doctor, I'm going to start worrying come Christmas on my bounce checks because we don't have any assurance from you, certainly, at the federal level they're going to be paid. And I think we all know how New York State does things. Uh, so now, you, you spoke to a smooth transition and that, import, that importance. Well, I disagree with you one thing. I believe taxpayer money is more important than a smooth transition when it comes to $265 million of losses adding to our debt. So it goes back to 2014, Health Republic lost $35 million. It's inconceivable to me what then happened. They were loaned an additional $91 million. I mean, I suppose, is that like doubling down on a stock that loses all its value so you go buy more? I, I don't know, other than your smooth transition, how we squandered another $91 million. Didn't ask any of the right questions. You just said, here's another $91 million, and sure enough, it's flushed. So can you speak to that $91 million after you knew they lost $35 million? Sure. The, 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 the way that you, we have set up co-ops is the vast majority of the funding, the vast majority of funding is needed to, to even set up the this is the new year of open enrollment. Sure. And you know what? They wrote more than expected. Yeah. Everyone else is complaining when they write right. less than expected. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Health Republic signed up more than expected. They did. They did. And, of course, the, the first time you have an understanding of the ability to match claims to the premiums they've collected isn't for some time because of the way uh, claims come in and because of the way the financials work. So it really wasn't until early to the middle of 2015 that we really started to, to have data that would give us reason to be significantly concerned about the state and about their ability to pay claims. Given well, my, my time's expired, but I can't just, oh, hey, every quarter, how'd you do this quarter? Uh, we only lost $30 million. That's not a fair characterization of how we worked with the, with the co-op. I just had a uh, follow-up for Ms. Brooks' question, and you had said you had some charts or things that relate to the state. Could you make sure you share those with us, too? I'd love to see what, not all your charts, apparently you make charts of everything. <laughs> But the relevant ones to comparing the states that'd be helpful. Okay. Now I recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Dr. Bouchon, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was a cardiovascular surgeon prior to coming to Congress, and I just want to say that you know uh, I want everyone in our country to have access to quality, affordable health care. And, and uh, that said, uh, I feel compelled to comment on the uninsured rate and that coverage doesn't necessarily uh, equal access. And I think that's a that's a point that. Maybe people that aren't in health care don't necessarily get, in fairness, and I'm not implying you, but others that have made comments. And because the Medicaid program, for example, traditional Medicaid is a program that doesn't reimburse providers at a level that many will accept. And even though people may have Medicaid, uh, doesn't necessarily access them to anything more than the emergency room, which they had access to when they, when they didn't have Medicaid. And the data shows that, that that's the truth. In Indiana, we, we uh, are using Healthy Indiana Plan 2.0 to cover those citizens, and this is something that I support because it's a state-based way to manage Medicaid dollars uh, more effectively and efficiently, in my opinion. Uh, and it's HSA-based, which you've heard some comments about HSAs in the past, which does encourage uh, uh, more proper utilization of the health care system by the person who has the coverage because they actually have some of their own financial resources at risk if they don't. <coughs> My question will be uh, about the plans offered under the exchanges. I mean, most of my questions have been answered about the technical aspects of what's happening with these plans. But I mean, many of, including yourself, have commented about $100 premiums. What percentage of people that are on the exchanges approximately are subsidized pe people? How, what, are there, what percentage of people, or maybe the better question yeah. is, that are getting coverage through the exchange don't get a subsidy? About 20 percent. So 20 percent don't get a subsidy. That's about right. And so the premiums for those folks, do you know what, what, the, how, what those are? I mean, what's the level of subsidy yeah. on average, for example, for a person on the exchange that's getting a subsidy? It's a tough question to answer. It depends on if they're silver, gold, bronze, and so right. forth. <laughs> and their income levels and a variety of factors. Okay. Because you know, the, my constituents are complaining about the deductibles. I mean, you, you, you also. Uh, and, uh, again, the devil's in the details, right? If you pay $100 for a premium and you're being subsidized 
most likely you're being subsidized thousands of dollars for your, you know, for your premium, uh, or maybe hundreds of dollars. Um, but your deductible is six to ten thousand uh, dollars. I would argue that p that those pl better plans than that were available before the Affordable Care Act, and uh, you could do that on the on the individual and small group marketplace almost before the Affordable Care Act and do better with that lower deductibles, l better premiums. So I just I don't see where you know we've created a huge advantage. The only thing we've done, as was pointed out, is we've mandated that people buy coverage. Um, so the question, in my view, is, is if someone has uh, a deductible, say you're a family of four, and, uh, you know, either you say only one p parent is working, whether that's the male man or the woman, <coughs> and they're a school teacher, uh, and they have a $10,000 deductible for their family when they have maybe an annual income of $55,000, $60,000 a year, uh, is that good health coverage? Well, you and I have both been in health care a long time. Yeah. Um, my reflection would be prior to the Affordable Care Act, health plans had, if you could get it, meaning you didn't have a pre-existing condition, you had no regulated out-of-pocket maximum, <coughs> you had higher rates of increase, and you could be dropped at any time. Now you have pre free well, those are services. Things th yeah, that, that is true. Eighty percent of That's folks have cost. coverage outside of the deductible. Uh, and there's a, there's a, a whole array of options and services today. So by, by my estimation and by the people that we interact with who are getting coverage, um, you know, their lives are better today. Notwithstanding your, your points about um, we have an affordability crisis in this country and we have, uh, and not everybody can afford all the services that they need, those are very legitimate concerns and, okay. and we share them. Fair enough, Fair Act, with, without massive subsidies from the federal taxpayer subsidizing the premium to keep the premium low. Uh, and I think that's that's a fair statement. Of course, you know, there's always exceptions to every to every rule. Um, but my con again, the other concern I have is uh, with the exchanges, my time's up, I'll make this brief comment and I'll one area of accounts receivable that they're starting to see is from insured individuals because they can't meet their deductibles, they can't pay that. So we've created an a, a different problem. Uh, I yield back. The gentleman yields back now. Recognize the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Kramer, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Administrator, for being here and for your incredible access. I've appreciated that as has my staff. And I want to. I'm going to shift gears a fair bit since I have this opportunity. Um, and it might not surprise you that I want to ask you about a discussion we had previously, and that has since resulted in my dropping some legislation. And that is that, that last March when CMS um, released a, a interim, an interim rule, interim final rule that gave authority to insurers that are offering patients with rare diseases and catastrophic illnesses are, are oftentimes the, um, the utilizers of, of this kind of uh, charity. Um, this rule has really had the effect of pushing individuals with pre-existing conditions off off the health plans that they purchased in an exchange. So that really means fewer fewer insured Americans and more patients with complex conditions in the federal safety net. Now, obviously under the ACA, the law provides uh, federal subsidies for health insurance as we're discussing. Why then did the administration offer a rule to prevent Americans from doing the same out of charity that the government uh, does now? And, uh, and, you know, since the release of the interim final rule, I think there's something like 30 or 31 states that have announced uh, a prohibition. This seems to be completely counterproductive to the goals of the ACA. That's why I dropped the bill. It has already got very broad support. I could name names and you'd go, wow, that's but give me some encouragement that may not require the law or, or that you're going to support the law, that the law change. Well, we, we share the same goal of trying to get everybody covered. Uh, and I appreciate your efforts in this area as well. Um, because we have an interim uh, proposed rule, I'm limited in what I can comment on the, on the rule, but we do appreciate your input. With that, I think we'll just keep pushing for um, co-sponsors co of the bill and try to make it a law, because it really is broadly supported, um, in both in Congress and certainly in the public. So with that, I have nothing further and would yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Yields back. Well, thank you. Uh, in that case, let me find my. 
Um, Ms. Slavitt, I just want to note that in uh, November 24th, the committee sent a letter to CMS regarding the failure of 12 out of 23 co-ops or nonprofit insurers set up through the ACA. These 23 co-ops were funded by government-backed loans to the tune of $2 billion. Uh, CMS's response to the co-op letter is due today. So uh, we do, but we are it is a high priority. Thank you very much. We'll answer all your questions. We appreciate it because we would like to get as you to get some answers to this. So we need to pursue that, and and we'll receive the um, other documents we requested today. You've already stated that, so thank you. Uh, in conclusion, I want to thank all. Uh, thank you for coming today, and the members that participated in today's hearing. I remind members they have ten business days to submit other questions for the record, and I ask also, Mr. Slavy, you agree to respond promptly to those questions. And with that, this subcommittee is adjourned. How are you feeling about how the expansion is going? And